Welcome. Uh, for those, or welcome for everyone, I suppose. Uh, the purpose of this meetup is to create a community of enthusiasts working in data science to learn from each other and to support each other and to advance good data science practice in Sydney and throughout Australia. So if you get to the end of the night and you think to yourself, I'd really like to present at one of these meetups because I like what they're doing, uh, please come to me and I'll put you in touch with Fabian or Eugene so that you can talk about talking. Uh, the meetup doesn't organise itself, so I probably thank some people before we get started. So firstly, thanks to Eugene, again in absentia, uh, who is both the founder and one of the main driving forces behind this community, in fact every data science community in Australia, pretty much. Uh, this one's just shy of 4,000 members, that's, uh, that's not too bad. Um, he's also a sponsor of the meetup, so I have to say he runs a training and consulting business called Prescient, spelled with two eyes. Uh, and you can find a link to the website from the meetup page. Thanks also to Fabian, who normally does all, all of the organising for this and organises all of the speakers, which he did actually do this week. Um, also thanks to Greg Pearl from NWorld at the back there. Um, Greg's been a sponsor of the meetup for as long as I've been coming to it. Um, he's a specialist recruiter for the data science field with a particular focus on fintech and startups. Uh, he'll normally say a few words at the end, so I won't say too much now for him, but he's always happy to catch up for a chat if you're thinking about a new job or you want to understand what's happening in the market. Um, and also thanks to Greg and Troy for recording the uh, talks tonight, which means that they'll be on YouTube shortly. Look out for those. And I should of course thank Commonwealth Bank, who provide the venue and catering for us every month. Uh, you probably met some of our talent acquisition team on the way in. Uh, hint, hint, we're hiring. Um, and in the breaks or at the end, you can come see me as well. If you're interested about a uh, career at ComBank, we do have many roles at the moment. There we go. Um, come see us at the end. <laughs> So, before we get started for the first talk, a bit of housekeeping. We've got two presentations. They should go for about 30 minutes each. Uh, we'll have time for questions after each one, and we'll have a 10 minute break in between so that you can grab a drink, stretch your legs, uh, do some networking. There'll be time for some announcements at the end, and you're welcome to stay and mingle until we get kicked out, which I don't know what time that is. Uh, when you do decide to leave, please remember to put your visitor pass in the big grey box. We haven't lost a pass yet, and we're not about to lose one on my watch, so please remember to hand it in when you leave. Um, and also, please remember to update your name on the meetup.com website so that you have both your first name and last name, because otherwise I get in trouble with security every single month. So please make sure that your meetup.com username has both your first name and your last name. First talk this evening is on the topic of malicious Android application detection using recurrent neural networks, presented by William Lee. William is a senior researcher at a cybersecurity company where he focuses on developing deep neural networks. Please welcome William. honored to be here to present my uh, topic. It's hard to imagine to live without smartphones nowadays. I store everything on my Android device. I store my photos and emails and contact information. Also, I have my ComBank application, so I can control everything with my device. So, but at the same time, that means the other side the dark side, cyber attackers can see this is a huge opportunity for them. So let me ask one question. How many of you use Android devices? There are quite a lot, I guess at least 50%. So Android is a huge market. That means that there's a lot of um, problems as well. So today I'm going to talk about Android malicious applications. And then I'm going to talk about on a way to solve the problem using deep learning neural networks. My name is William Lee. I'm a, I work at a cybersecurity company called the Sophos. So I am a data science. I have about five years data science experience. I develop a machine learning algorithm for our product. So our product 
uh, include the firewalls and the antivirus software for mobile devices and the computers. And also I am a data engineer. I do everything from the ETL to visualization. Also I'm a speaker. I presented the machine learning topics at various uh, international conferences. Actually this talk I present at the uh, AVA conference last year in China. The first part is about Android application. How many, uh, actually, the number of apps in Android platform is huge. Can you guess the number of apps? In 2016, the number of apps in Android platform is about 8 million. But more interesting is the malicious app, number of malicious apps is about 4 million. <laughs> like 50% app is malicious app is a huge problem actually. Probably you haven't seen any, I mean, encountered any malicious app in your device, you are just lucky. If you think, probably most of you use uh, uh, download application from the Google Play App Store. Probably you think it's the uh, most safe, safest place, but it's not. So as you can see, these are the malicious app found in Google Play App Store. So there's quite a lot of apps, malicious apps in Google Play App Store. And also if you look at the download counter, for, for example, one, uh, I mean the famous app is one million download. That means one million I mean, users are affected with these malicious apps. Uh, let me show you two examples of malicious app found in Google Play App Store. This one uh, called uh, Cowboy Adventure. It looks like a uh, normal, uh, simple game application. Actually, it is a game application. But uh, when you finish your the first stage, uh, you, you will be asked to log into your uh, Facebook uh, I mean, account, like uh, the Facebook UI. But actually, it is fake UI. So if you enter the fake, I mean, the, uh, the uh, log into your Facebook account, then you are sending your credentials to the, I mean, the cyber criminals. Actually, as you can see, the download count is about one million. So one million, they have the, your or your friends' user credential information. So this is one particular, I mean, example. Uh, malicious app can be found in Google Pay. There are so many different apps. Also, another one, uh, literally, we found from the Google Play App Store. It's an uh, interesting one. Coin miner. Nowadays, uh, I mean, coin miner is a, a good way of, I mean, <laughs> on some extra money. But actually, this app, uh, it must be as a clean and um, benign app. It's like a simple tutorial application for beginners to learn some, I mean, program language. But actually, if you look at the uh, source code, we compile, we can decompile the code to see the, the I mean, the internal. The code, as you can see, it actually it contacts the I mean outside the uh, the the CNC server with some random numbers. So basically, it is running uh, <coughs> JavaScript on your machine on, on your device, and it run cyber I mean the uh, crypto algorithm to I mean run the algorithm. So actually, it is it is not slim your money, but it is slim your CPU time. That means. Uh, uh, you are using, I mean, your battery to some, I mean, uh, useless reward. But these are the some of the examples of uh, the malicious app uh, can be found in the Google Play App Store. So we just have seen the, some uh, the Maria landscape in Google, I mean, the Android platform. And then let me talk about the, our talk, so how we can solve the problems. So uh, these are the popular, one of the most popular applications in um, the Android or I iPhone applications, Facebook and Instagram. How can you recognize which app is, I mean, the genuine the Android, I mean, application? So we can recognize application by application name or icon or the developer name. For example, yeah, Facebook. We recognize everyone recognize Facebook and Facebook name and the developer Facebook. But probably I I I, I chose Facebook as I mean highly reputable reputable application but literally uh, 
it turns out to be not that, I mean, safe publication to post anything. Maybe it's a good idea to, I mean, <laughs> uninstall this app. But uh, for this, I mean, the use case, uh, we can't see the face with, I mean, the safe publication to use. So here, uh, the, actually, there's a lot of apps, but uh, we can define the application ID in Android with the two terms. So the Facebook, actually, the Facebook is just application name, but internally it has a unique application ID called the taxi name. So as you can see, the taxi name is something like URL, like the com. Facebook Cantana is a unique application ID for the, the Facebook, and each uh, Android application. Uh, needed to be signed with developer certificate information. So, for example, here the Facebook, uh, the certificate information, the owner name is like uh, um, C, uh, country U.S. state, California, and L locality and organization and common name. So, with the certificate name, uh, we can identify the specific um, developer. So, with the package name and the certificate information, we can identify one specific application in Google Apps Store. So uh, we are going to use these two strings to detect malicious apps. Okay, it's a quiz time. Uh, there's a two types of application. One is one group is malicious and another one is a, a benign application. Probably you already uh, easily, immediately recognize which one is malicious. For example, the first one today is Facebook. So we just uh, can see it is, uh, looks okay, nothing suspicious. And the second one, Instagram. Yeah, it's uh, all looks good. However, the third one, can you pronounce it? Uh, maybe uh, or something. <laughs> so actually, actually, it's a random string, the application name. And also, uh, the certificate owner name, as you can see, is also randomly generated strings. And so the, uh, the other things are also the same. The last one is something different. So it looks like Facebook, it looks like Facebook something, but there are some random strings, random numbers in between. And the certificate owner name, uh, it has a CN Android debug. This is for the debugger purpose uh, certificate. It should not be, I mean, used for the, the product, the release version. So it's not, uh, I mean, proper certificate. So the answer is really simple. The first group is benign, and the next one is malicious. As you can see, it is not hard to identify which one is malicious or not. So that means, uh, according to the Andrew, um, if we can, uh, I mean, uh, the solve the problem within the, a few seconds, the, the problem can be solved using machine learning. So let's try whether we can solve this problem with the machine learning. However, in cybersecurity components, the problem is uh, uh, the older technology is based on the signature-based uh, detection solutions. That means. Uh, uh, we can use some random strings to detect malicious app, but the problem is uh, there are so many different I mean random strings. It's impossible to I mean detect with the, the random strings. Maybe another solution is uh, we can uh, use uh, we can find some patterns, so we can use a uh, regular expression to detect some random string. But actually, it is not scalable. So the next solution is we can use uh, machine learning, so it will understand everything. Uh, within the uh, the string and then generate the I mean the algorithm to detect those things. So we are going to try the signature based machine learning the approaches here. So our goal is quite simple. We are going to build a classification model, uh, which will be uh, using uh, two strings, application packet name and certificate owner information. The goal is to detect whether the application is malicious or not using the only two strings. And then our goal is we are going to deploy the trained model into the, our Android device as Android application. So model should be lightweight so we can deploy it to the uh, Android device. Okay, our goal is quite clear. And then after, uh, next, next thing, we have to look into the Android applications in detail. 
So Android application uh, is packaged at APK client. So the APK part is basically uh, the chip archive containing many different components. So it has uh, developer information, a certificate information, native code, and the image files, the resource files, uh, and the Java code. Uh, here we are going to use the developer information from the certificate file, and then uh, there's another file called the important one, Android XML. It uh, contains all the information about the application unit ID and some other permissions. When you install the application, uh, you will uh, <coughs> eat the, the application, I mean the Android point display the what permission will be installed sometimes. This is also important information. Okay, the next part is the, in, uh, the deep neural network uh, introduction. Why deep learning is so popular and so successful in many uh, different uh, domains? So the first thing uh, what I can see is uh, the automated future engineering is quite I mean the important characteristic of deep neural network. I, I think. So let's say we have the two, two uh, strings. What you can do is you can probably you can use the um, uh, engram. Yeah, to extract some pieces. But actually, you don't need to do anything. Just you can use the, the string as it is. So the neural network can learn the patterns from the strings and learn some hidden insights. That's the good thing about the deep neural network. Another one is uh, if your data is huge. For example, uh, we uh, have like. Uh, 20 million malicious samples, so that means uh, when we train the traditional machine learning model, is it possible to load the huge data into the main memory? Even we are using, uh, I mean, the huge uh, EC2 instance in AWS, it's impossible to load the whole data into the, uh, the main memory. But however, the deep neural network, uh, uh, they employ the uh, stochastic gradient descent mechanism, so you can divide the samples into mini batch and you can run the, the algorithms. Also, the most important thing is usually deep neural network. If you have the right the, the architecture, you can get the best performance out of it. That's the best part of the I mean, deep neural networks. Okay, let me talk about some uh, ingredient in deep neural network. So, uh, in deep neural network, uh, we can define the, the model with the architecture. So each layer has its uh, own parameters. And then uh, we have to define the loss function. We can measure the, the errors. And then the next thing is that the algorithm with uh, updated parameters find the best solution for us. This is in a high level view. <coughs> but it is a good idea to visualize the, I mean, the everything in video. So uh, let me the, show you the two minute video, which is explaining the everything about the deep neural level. Massive amounts of stored data 
beyond the limits of traditional machine learning. This is the rep. Yeah, let's go. Are you going to move on? No, let's go. Can you buy the idea? <laughs> actually, this is one of our production, uh, uh, promotion video. Actually, I had uh, spent uh, quite a lot of time to cut the, I mean, a brand related uh, part. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> okay. Uh, let me talk about the, the model uh, <clears throat> we are going to build. So I'm going to use a two simple, I mean, model. Uh, the first one is a field portal network, the standard one to just compare with the RNN. The RNN, um, we are going to use the RNN to, I mean, use the string data. So the, the RNN can be used for many different, I mean, I mean, problems, for example, sequence prediction and sentiment analysis, classification problem, uh, sequence, sequence uh, language translation. So many problems can be I mean, applied with uh, RNN. So uh, long short term LSTM is uh, called a long short term memory. It, it is type of a recurrent neural network. So for the first model, I'm going to use this one. So basically, it has a three I mean gate and memory set. It can run uh, the dependency with the long I mean sequence data. Uh, just to compare with the uh, Peter Porter network and the recurrent neural network, um, we uh, I'm going to use a two different set of the picture. For the uh, recurrent neural network, uh, we are going to use the string data as it is, but for the field folder network, I have to convert some data. Uh, so I'm going to use the HESI, the HESI mechanism. So basically, I can calculate the HESI value from the two strings, and the two, two, the, I mean, the HESI value will be used for the field folder network parameters in the features. Yeah, okay, let's have a look at the, the models. So the first one is field folder network. It's a really simple model. So yeah, we will be using the hash value from the two strings and then the two hidden uh, fully connected layers. And the last one is uh, just uh, the dense sigmoid output. And uh, uh, another one is uh, recurrent neural network. But we are going to use two branches for each input. One input from the packaging name, another input from the certificate owner name. So the first unit uh, layer is embedding. Embedding convert the string data into the uh, <coughs> fixed length, real value, uh, the dense, I mean the vectors. So those value, those output can be used for the, uh, the LSTM. So and each output from the uh, each branch will be merged and concatenated for the final output. So it's a, a pretty simple model. Let's have a look at the performance of the two models. So uh, the train set uh, was about 2 million and Tesla was 1.5 million. And uh, as you can see, uh, the blue line, blue color is from the field fold network and the orange one is from the RNN. And RNN achieved like uh, 95% accuracy at the epoch, about one, uh, 100 epochs. And as you can see, the ROC curve shows the same um, data. The RNN uh, absolutely outperformed the simple field network in this case. Okay, let's have a look at the previous example of the quiz. So our model has to print uh, uh, the output. This is from the our model's output. So as you can see, the clean samples got the 0 0.06. Uh, if we set the threshold as 0 0.5, it's clean. Air. And however, the uh, next group, it got about uh, 0 0.8 or 9 something. So it detects as malicious air. So this simple application can be a solve like this, this simple problem, I mean the models. However, it cannot solve all the problems. Let's have a look at what are the remaining issues. For example, the, the first one, uh, blue dot sky is something, and it has certificate information. But our model, uh, the output is uh, 0.06, so it detects as a clean application, but actually, this is one of the malicious apps, so it's a false negative. And the second one, so our model detects malicious app, but actually it's a clean application, so it's a false positive. So the model has false positive and false negative problem. So how we can solve this problem? Actually, uh, with only with the, the string data, it's hard to solve the problem. So we are going to introduce additional input to the model. 
So if we, if we look at the previous, uh, I mean, the malicious samples, the blue sky application, so it is a fake in solar application. That means it looks like, as you, it, you can see, the icon looks like the, the game application, but it's not game, but it just display an annoying advertisement continuously, so it, we call it fake in solar. And uh, if you look at, if you formulate the Android permissions, it has some, I mean, highly suspicious permissions and intent action. So we can use this additional information to improve the, the performance. So this is our final, I mean, model. So basically, we are going to use two, I mean, the same approach from the two strings, of the CNN approaches. I'm uh, sorry, the RN approach, and then we add additional friends for the the, the package information, uh, sorry, uh, the permission information. So basically it has three server, server network, and then we can uh, the concatenate output for the final output. So also, uh, the, I mean, the many, uh, the, the LSTM or uh, recurrent neural network can be stacked in the network, but for this case we are going to add additional one-dimensional compression neural network. Because the reason is uh, the, uh, the uh, string or text is actually a sequence of characters. And also we can see is a one-dimension image. So convolutional 1D can recognize spatial dependency within the string data. So actually the one of the, the problem of uh, the LSTM when you train the data with the huge data, it takes a long time to train the, I mean, the model. So, uh, if, if, so the, if you introduce a uh, one-dimensional convolution neural network, actually, uh, it compresses the, the data. So the, it can speed up the training, uh, even it can still understand the spatial dependency within the simulator. So also we replace the LSTM with the GRU. GRU is, a, I mean, the offline version of the LSTM. It reduces the, the gate from 3 to... Yep. Sorry, um, let me skip some option. I took a long time. So actually, the, our model takes the previous post-band post-negative with this one. So also another problem is in deep neural network is interoperability. It's hard to I mean, explain what's going on inside. So, uh, uh, we are going to tackle this problem as well. So uh, the way we are going to is we are going to predict the each output from the each branch. So basically, uh, we will be uh, the model is a multi input, multi output model. So we will be having one output from the each branch and the final output. So this way we can tell which components are the malicious one. For example, here. So this one, the package name is a 0 0.4. And the certificate name, uh, name points is 0 0.9 and the permission to 0 0.8. So we can say uh, the application, the certificate point is not correct, is something suspicious or the permission. So final output is 0 0.99. So it's malicious there. This is one way to, I mean, the, we can explain the, the I mean, data. So uh, this, this plot shows, I mean, our performance against the, the three models. As you can see, the, uh, the combined, the, how that end model uh, doing the best work, best job. Also, it is a good idea to measure the performance over time. So what we did is actually we trained the model and then we measured the performance over six months, like this one. So as you can see, the PDF photo network, it actually memorized actually. So after six months, the performance dropped dramatically. But our model, it learns the, I mean, the, the hidden dependence between the strings. So, it doing well uh, after six months. So our goal is to deploy the trained model into the, our uh, the Android device. So it is important to measure the other I mean, metrics. So the model it trained was a 1.8 parameters, and the model size actually we uh, uh, use the Keras and TensorFlow backend, but we convert the I mean the model. I trained with Pi as a TensorFlow the file format and it, it is about seven megabytes. It's small, quite small. So if we want to achieve the same, I mean the performance with the uh, random forest, it requires like a five hundred megabyte in the trained file size. It's impossible to yeah, deploy into the small device. And also the prediction speed is twenty milliseconds quite okay and uh, the prediction power is quite impressive. 
the summary is, I mean, there's a lot of malicious apps, and uh, those applications have, I mean, random strings to avoid the detection based on the uh, signature based detection. But uh, using the deep neural network, so we can solve these small problems. So I wanted to keep uh, you uh, store everything on my device. I believe the, the power of uh, machine learning. Thank you. Uh, did you? Uh, sorry. Did you count? Did you compare with the performance with some traditional machine learning algorithms, such yes. as uh, random forest or? Yeah. Uh, we measure this. I mean, the, we use the same the train, I mean, the same test set. Yeah. Uh, with the random forest, and uh, uh, we uh, realized the uh, the our I mean the. Uh, deep neural network based, uh, I mean, the, the model outperformed the, I mean, the traditional models. Also, another aspect is, I mean, the, because we wanted to deploy the model into the, I mean, small, I mean, limited, I mean, resource, so it was also the, I mean, to train file size was quite important. Yeah. Uh, what type of techniques did you use actually to reduce the model size and how was it? Uh, actually, impacting the performance. Of the so in uh, in the model, there's a lot of hyperparameters you, you, you can I mean tune. For example, uh, the part layer is embedding, so you can I mean the I, I mean the tune the different I mean the output or the size and the, the CNN and the RNN the filter size and the number of filters. There's so many I mean different configurations you can play. So actually, I uh, to optimize one I mean the uh, best uh, uh, the model. Uh, it will take a long time with all the I mean, different parameters. Yeah, so it's good idea to use like high performance GPU instances. Yeah. Well, the techniques that you have used here are supervised. Have you tried any unsupervised approach? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, we haven't tried any unsupervised mechanism. Your hand. Yeah. Hi. So um. I saw that uh, you used the feed forward neural network for the permissions. Is there a reason why you did that and would it have been improved by using recurrence instead? Yes, that's true. Actually, yeah, the limitation of the, I mean, the recurrent neural network using only the string data has a limitation. As I mentioned, the post positive or post negative. That's why we introduced additional data to fix the problem. So it is a good idea to combine the different, I mean, the input data and the using the different network. So fix for some specific problems. Should be on. It just has to pick up the volume. Hello. Um, so you, the, you said there's seven and a half million apps on the Android store. So in the test set, how how many apps were in the test set, and how long did it take to prepare the test set? And then as well as that, did you do? Is, was there like an out of sample set to check for? Like training on noise. Well, um, actually, I haven't checked. I mean, those uh, the seven million samples are in our the training set. There's no way to I mean easily compare. Actually, we collect uh, I mean a lot of Android the applications from all different sources. The Google Play App Store is one of them. But also because when we train the uh, the model. Also, we have a lot. We have a lot of, I mean, the malicious samples, but uh, there's only, I mean, the limited samples in Google Play. So, so we have another source of the, the samples. So when we train the, actually, we um, uh, the sample size is about 20 million samples, and the, the malicious sample is quite high. It's like 50, almost 50, 50. And but yeah, it's hard to, I mean, check whether I mean the older uh, current samples are from the Google Play. But I don't think that there's a lot of, I mean, Google Play Exercise is just one of them. Uh, there's a lot of, many people, I mean, the third party app stores in, uh, I mean, the, in the world. For example, in China, Google App Store is, uh, I mean, not allowed it. So it's pumped and blocked by, I mean, the government. So they have their own, I mean, the app store. So also we break the both sectors. Okay. Uh, uh, this is the first time actually I've seen that the combination of uh, CNN and RNN. 
So that's, is, is it some standard concept or you define uh, for your particular use case? No, it's not my, it's not the first idea from me, but yeah, so it is a, because I, one of the problems of the, the recurrent neural network, uh, training takes a long time, it's not one day job, I mean one week, something like that, with the, I mean 10 million samples. So actually, uh, recurrent, uh, the RNN, convolution of uh, one dimension RNN, actually with the convolution and, and the pooling, the pooling actually, I mean, reduces size. If you uh, pull size is two, so it will, I mean, the reduce the input size as a half, something like that. So it, I mean, the speed of the training. Hi. So my question kind of follows on from that, and maybe you kind of answered it a little bit already. But uh, I'm wondering when you were switching between the recurrent from the recurrent neural network structure to the convolution, the one D convolutional structure, did you use in that situation, I know there's literature on this, but in that situation, do you use traditional convolutional neural network techniques? You mentioned max pooling then. Um, same structure with the layers, like increasing um, the term, but the, the number of layers. Um, or do you use something slightly different or adjusted to match that yeah. scenario? So I just use a really simple uh, CNN model. The one, uh, one demands a convolution with the uh, uh, the corner size is three by three, and the um, the padding the same, and then just one. I mean the pulling layer, really simple one, but not any I mean special thing. Yeah. 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 Um, so your final model had three neural networks that got combined yes. into a final output, right? Okay. And two of them handled text data, and one handled the permissions data, yep. which is, I assume, like on-off switches or whether your yes, program yeah, yeah. Can, can write to your storage or access the internet, right? Yes. So you said that there were 18 million weights that you trained in the final model. Yep. Like, so how many of these weights belong to the text part, and how many belong to the permissions part? Well, I don't have the data. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Because it seems to me that, like, in the text data, you will have a lot more like variables, and in the permission side, you have less variables. Like, is that? Yeah, but I, uh, of course, I don't have the data. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I think that's that's probably all the questions we have time for. So thank you, William.